Hey guys, this is Joshua with the Duct Tape Channel, and in this video we're going to be discussing cavitation and how coolant can actually destroy your engine just as fast as bad oil, but instead of just discussing it, I wanted to actually show you what I'm doing here. So we have a C13 torn down here. It had compression gases in the cooling system, even at cold, right when it starts up. It could be 30 degrees out, has compression gases. You can see what the coolant color is. It's a brown color compared to what it should be, which is this red color. So, isolated the air compressor. No, it was not the air compressor. So, customers said, hey, you guys can pull the cylinder head, see if maybe we have a cracked head. Looked at the head gasket here, uh, really looking for something. Uh, there might, might have been a little crack there, but I don't think there was. Uh, no visible cracks on the cylinder head. Uh, no damage to the fire rings from what I could see. So, we decided, hey, let's take a look at the liners. Maybe something weird's going on there. Taking a look at the liners here, and the this is liner number five. And this is a C13, so it's a six-cylinder engine. And look what we see here. Now, this is really weird. I've never seen this on a C13. But there's these little rust bubbles, and this is not like I dripped coffee or something into the liner here. They don't wipe off. You can't feel them. It's like they're coming through the back of the liner, which raises the question, what the heck is this? Now, cavitation typically on CAT engines, in my experience, has been on the C-15s more than on these C-13s or C-11s or C-12s. And typically, it doesn't eat through the liner as much as it does into the block itself. But that's not to say that they these engines are immune from heavy cavitation. Now, the problem with having pitting on the liners, you can't see the coolant passages. And you'd have to see the backside. Now look at this bluing mark too. That also makes me wonder if we have some sort of compression gases or something cutting through the liner here and maybe heating up this particular part of the block. Not sure, it just looked weird to me. So my idea was let's pull the backside of the oil cooler off and then we should be able to see part of the liner and we can look for pitting without having to pull the cylinder pack out and drain the oil because the customer hadn't given us authorization yet. So need to remove the low pressure turbo mount here and the bolts that hold it on are two of them are studs with nuts and two are bolts and then we're going to remove the downpipe off the turbo well the turbo has gone obviously and i'm using this loctite product uh penetrating oil we also have access to the zep super penetrant here um i don't like the zep one as much it's more of like a wd-40 and the reason i don't love wd-40 that much is it's a solvent based at least the SEP one is, is a solvent-based penetrating oil. The problem with the solvent-based one is it'll dry overnight or over time instead of an oil-based one. Now I'm just zipping these off with my half-inch Bosch, Bosch gun here. And pretty much all the tools I'm going to be using, I'll put an Amazon affiliate link in here. I like the Bosch tools. They're cheaper than the Milwaukee's. Do they hit as hard? Probably not, but I've had this gun for seven years, and you can see it's in very good shape. The bat, these are the original batteries still. They hold a charge well. If you guys are going to buy any of the tools I'm using, use the affiliate links, please. It really, really helps the channel. You guys have been, and I really appreciate that. So, going to be using our IR hammerhead here. It's an impact. It is not an air ratchet. I hate air ratchets. And we're going to be pulling off our friend the downpipe here. So, once we get the downpipe off, then we should be able to remove the rear portion of the oil cooler. And like I said, the reason we want to remove that is I want to see what that liner looks like without having to pull the oil and the drain the pan and pull the oil pump pickup. So we've already drained the coolant. We had to, to remove the cylinder head. But like I usually tell people, always drain it at the block as well. So this is the bottom of the oil cooler housing here. There is a plug on the bottom. You want to pull this plug. If you do not pull the plug, you're going to get a lot more coolant than you think you're going to get on the ground. So we pulled the plug, and look at that. That's a lot of coolant. We got at least another gallon, probably closer to two gallons, out of the block in the oil cooler just by pulling that plug. Now, there are five bolts that hold the rear oil cooler housing on, and then there's just two O-rings that seal it to the block. Gonna be using my IR little 3 8 impact here. And I'm gonna zip these two bolts out. These two bolts are easy to get to, and then there are three on the backside. I'm gonna leave this one in loosely. Now the ones on the backside are not easy to get. One is particularly difficult to get. You got one of the bolts. 
And then I got one of the other bolts. Now this last bolt, now this is sped up 500%, so five times faster than normal. That'd be good for flat rate times, huh? It took me probably, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes to get this one bolt out. I, ah, uh, ah, uh, but eventually I did get it out. Now, I often wonder why they have to put certain bolts in certain places. Well, once you get the bolt, you can just put it along with its friends, the other bolts, for reinstallation later. Now, one weird thing about these oil coolers is the amount of threads that go into the housings. And I'm wondering if it's not because they're aluminum, but a typical rule of thumb is the thread engagement area, meaning how many threads hold a component together, is generally about the width of the head of the drive unit. So this is a eight millimeter bolt that has a 13 millimeter drive head. That's around how much threads are usually holding it together. This one though is like triple that. And uh, sometimes when you go to put these back together, you're like, well, these, I don't think these are the right bolts, but they are. So a little more penetrating oil here. And this that is to help slide the O-rings out. If you're removing anything with O-rings, typically if you put any sort of lubricant on them, penetrating oil works really well. It will help you remove them easier. Now, unfortunately, I, I could only see this portion of the liner. I, I thought I'd be able to see a little bit more of the liner. This is all I could see. I could not see any cavitation on this section of the liner, but that doesn't mean it's not there. I just can't see the rest of the liner. I tried with a mirror, I tried with a boroscope. Uh, that did not film very well, but... So we had to call the customer. They gave us authorization to, hey, just pull the liner. I mean, you guys already have the cylinder head off. So drain the oil, pulled the oil pan, pulled the connecting rod cap off. Now we're gonna be using these pullers that pull the liner and the piston pack all at one. So they just go in and then you tighten this inner nut. Now I'm gonna mark where the uh, bubbles were on the liner so that while it's out, it'll be easy to find. Use my Bosch again. Bosch hits pretty hard. Um, I've removed head bolts off these C13s with it, rod bolts. Um, I don't think I've ever been able to remove main bolts. I think I've been able to torque turn them though, but uh, we're gonna be pulling it. So the inner one tightens and holds against the face of the liner. And then this one is just an H-bar puller style that goes against the deck and then it pulls the liner up. At least that's the theory. Sometimes, especially on the 15s that have three liner O-rings, whereas the 13s only have one, that doesn't always work. As you can see, this one worked really good. It just pulled it right out. So now we're gonna remove the H-bar puller and then we're gonna pull the whole liner out as a package. Now this has fractured connecting rods so we have to be very careful just in case the customer wants to remove them because we don't want to damage the fractured section of the rod or the rod cap. Now if you think these are light, you might be wrong. They are pretty heavy. And these aren't quite as bad as the C15 ones, but it's in a bad spot. Number five is always the worst. So the next portion of this video is gonna be... And the reason it's gonna be is because here's our liner. Look at those cavitation holes. So this is what I was exactly looking for. And cavitation, although this might be electrolysis, I believe it's cavitation though, is from boiling water in the cooling system by not maintaining the cooling system generally, or it can be also caused by a lack of adequate pressure in the cooling system or running the wrong type of coolant. Now this coolant was nasty, so I'm not really that surprised. And these were pretty deep. They were almost the depth of the liners themselves, which would make sense, and that's why we're getting bubbles in the cooling system. The compression gases, remember your compression pressure is very high in the cylinder is actually pushing air into the cooling system, which is this area. That's how deep these are. And those are where the bubbles are coming from, folks. So this is pretty much turning into a full rebuild where it was looking like it might've just been a cylinder head. Thanks for watching.